Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to New Life Church. My name is Grant. I'm one of the pastors here at New Life, and it's wonderful to have you here with us this morning. We want to know how we can be praying for you. We want to know how we can best serve you, and the best way for us to do that is for you to head to the website, fill out a connection card, and let us know that you're here. If you've been attending with us for a while, or if you're brand new here, we want to know how we can best serve you. So the best way to do that is for you to fill out that connection card and let us know that you are here with us this morning. Well, this week is our Grandparenting Summit. And if you're registered for that, get excited. If you still want to register for that, there's a little bit of time left, but it's a great way for you to get involved in the lives of your grandkids and the best way to impact them. So there's gonna be a lot of information, and I know that many of you are really excited about that. But if you want to register, make sure you do that this week so you can attend this summit. We'll also be praying for the elders this weekend as well. It's the the elder retreat. We're going to be talking about the mission and vision behind the church and the future of new life. So please keep the elders in your prayers as we're going to be talking about where New Life Church is headed for the future and we all get to be a part of that. Welcome this morning. Come worship with us. I am Prince Paul Konu from Ghana, uh, West Africa. Uh, I've been a pastor for 30 years. And right now I am involved in church planting uh, in the boonies where there is no Christian witnesses. Most of the places have no access road. You have to park your car somewhere walk over 10 miles to reach the people in the jungle. These are local people who grow their own food. The Sesa and they eat the rest. And they are far away from the big cities. They don't have a running water, they have no electricity. So as they don't have schools very close to them. So the church planting ministry has been so successful uh, for the past 10 years, we've been able to plant uh, 56 churches so far, and uh, God is good. And as time goes by, the, we are also involved in the sewing class for single mothers. Some are drop out from school. Some went through abuse of eight kinds, and they come to sewing class for two years, which New Life Church have been part of this program. They provide a sewing machine and eight accessories for the candidate for the three year, two years program. And after they are done, the sewing machine become DS, and they use it to have a scale to work to live by. Right now, 40 ladies have been graduated and uh, another 20 will be having their graduation coming December. And another new group also set in 
from December to have another two years program. Beside this, our ministry is still involved, also involved in the mission school, mission elementary school, which is called New Life Academy, because this church was involved purchasing this facility from a Muslim group who are out of business because they abuse their children and their lands that have been seized. And we started running this program from last year, but because of the COVID, the school has been closed. We have restarted again. We have uh, 120 kids and six teachers, and it is very good. And mostly the community is uh, about 90% were Muslims, and they are bringing their kids in, and we are able to reach them out with the gospel, which I think. Uh, we are making a headway to prepare the next generation of the parents to become Christians. The most importantly, the sewing class, most of the ladies comes there, they are not Christians. But before they finish their two years program, they receive Christ and they go back to their family with joy and hope. And those from Muslim family, they find it difficult to go back to their family because of their newfound religion. For that matter, they will not be accepted. So they move on to other big cities to get a job. And about four of them are in the big cities working for a garment factory. They have been connected to Bible-believing churches where they provide them accommodation to share room with some other ladies. And life is okay for them. So I, I think uh, sewing school have a great impact on these ladies, which only eternity can reveal what impact uh, this ministry have made on them. Uh, in the first place, uh, New Life has made a great impact in all these ministries, the church planting, uh, the school, and the sewing school. And uh, I will encourage them to continue giving us the needed support. Uh, right now, the sewing class, a new group is coming. We need about 20 sewing machines for the new group. Otherwise, I'm not sure the new group will be able to start. And uh, beside that, uh, the, uh, the New Life Academy in Ghana we have a struggle supporting the teachers who are teaching the children because parents are not able to afford school fees because for the past month, past year, there's a drugs. Uh, late, the rain came so late and most of their crops are not able to make it to go to the market to have money. So we wish we could get some support from New Life, at least to be able to support these teachers. A teacher is being paid $55 a month. Uh, so their support will be highly appreciated. We also need 500 Bibles uh, to share among our 56 churches to be used for evangelism and the leadership training. And uh, our past, some of our pastors are having health problems and uh, we don't know, we have two young men who are not married, they are single and they have the Spirit of God upon them. So the ministry wants to send them to the seminary to have one year course and come back and take over from some of the old leaders, pastors who are having health problems. Uh, their names are Prosper and David they need your prayer support. And they need the support of $1,000 each to start a school in November the 10th. And also, I want the New Life Church to be praying for our ministry in Ghana because there's a lot of challenges and it's only prayer that can change things. Thank you. Well, this morning, I have the privilege of inviting up Prince Paul to join me here on stage. Will you guys welcome him? Applause 
I think it's pretty clear that God's doing some pretty incredible things. It's also clear that there's continued need for support. Maybe you're here today and you're thinking, man, I could buy a sewing machine or I could support a teacher for $55 a month. Or maybe God's leading me to help one of these young pastors for $1,000 get to go to seminary. I think those are challenges that we could step up to. But more importantly, we want to be a people that comes around and continues to support and praise and encourages and loves and helps in a way where we can see God help people find new life in Christ here, near, and far. And so we're continuing to do that as a church with individuals like Prince Paul, who's living it in many ways. So I'm going to encourage you guys to meet him out in the great room. If you get a chance after the service, talk to him, hear his stories. He has stories for days. And that video was about six minutes long. It could have been 60 minutes long. And so please talk to him, hang out with him, and hear what God's doing in Ghana. Can I pray for you this morning? Dear Lord, we thank you so much for who you are. We thank you that you are a God that loves us, that knows us, that cares for us wherever we are in this world. We thank you so much for what you're doing in Ghana. We thank you for New Life Academy and the 120 kids that are there, Lord. For the women that are in the sewing ministry, that are going places and taking your name with them. We thank you for these young pastors that are rising up, that are planting churches all over the area. And so we pray, Lord, for a great awakening in your name, that there will be those that have never heard you that will know you and that will see you and find you and carry your name to the ends of the earth. Uh, there's a revival for those that do know you. And Lord, they will know you more clearly and that they will come and be used by you in ways that we just stand in awe of. We thank you specifically for Prince Paul and for his work and for his time and his effort. We know it can be draining. We know it can be hard. We know it can be difficult. And so, Lord, I just pray right now that you will give him the power and strength and perseverance and energy to do all the things that you've called him to do. We thank you that we have opportunity to be here today to pray for him, to encourage him, to support him. And, Lord, we pray for years to come that your name is known because of what's going on in Ghana. We thank you so much for who you are. We give you all praise. In Jesus' name, everybody said? Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. So please, afterwards, you have a time. If you have a chance, talk to them. It will be worth your while. But hey, this morning, like I mentioned, we're going to be taking communion. And we're going to spend some time right now for the next number of minutes just focused on what it was that Jesus did for us. And so I'm going to encourage you just in your space, we're going to sing a song, we're going to take the elements together, we're going to sing another song. But as we talk about the image of God, I really just want to be in this space this morning thinking about what it is that Jesus did for us and how his call to us is to do the same. To love people the way that he loved us, to love the world the way that he loved the world. And to sit here in this moment as we think about who he is and what he's done, and to think about what he's doing all over the world, my prayer is that we stand in awe of who God is. And so that's my encouragement this morning, that as we sing this first song, as we think about what Jesus did, that we will stand in awe of who he is. So can you stand with me this morning as we sing? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Father, Son, and Holy 
morning as we think about what it is that Jesus did and who he is. One of the thoughts that I've had through this series is we talk about image. Image specifically today is image as being like Christ. We're going to get into some of the details of that, but as we think about communion and we stand here today, I don't know if I could do what Jesus did. In fact, I guarantee you I could not do what Jesus did. If image is to be like him and he tells me to follow after him and to love people the way that he did, to be willing to die for those the way that he did, I look around our world today and I'm not willing to do that. Which has been a huge, huge aha moment for me in the fact that I love people, I serve people, but is it enough? In fact, there are times I'm not even willing to give up my comfort for those around me let alone my very own life. And yet Jesus said, be like me. And then when he went and did what we could not do. And so we stand here today, sit here today, wherever we're at at home here today, with the opportunity to remember the intense love of a savior that said, I will do what you cannot. I will pay for your sins. I will love people in a way that nobody else has or ever will. And I ask you to follow after me. All I can do when I think of that is stand in awe because there's only one worthy of worship, and that's Jesus. The night before he went to the cross, he took the bread, and he probably didn't have a package like this where there's a thin little thing that you open up on the top. But he took the bread that night, and he broke it, and he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. took the cup and said this is the new covenant in my blood do so in remembrance of me Jesus we thank you for what it is that you did we thank you for your love for the fact that we come before you today and we remember and we stand in awe that you did the thing that we could not do and that you did it willingly that you gave yourself, which is a challenge to each one of us to do the same thing for others around us, to give of ourselves. And yet we cannot do like it, do it like you did. You gave everything, and in doing so, you paid the price for our sins. And in doing that, you open the door to eternity so that we can be with you forever and worship every single day. I pray that we do that not just in eternity, but we do that right here, Lord, and that we worship you every day with this moment being the continuation of it as we understand what you did for us. We're so grateful, Jesus, for who you are. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Child of weakness 
God, what a king. We sing to his name, that's the name of Jesus, because he paid it all upon that cross for our sins. And together, God's church said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated.
Good morning again. If you are entering the room late or you're joining us a little late online, I want to welcome you this morning. My name is Brett. I'm the lead pastor here at New Life. And we are in our series called Why It Matters. And today was a day to understand why it matters. That we come here on Sundays to worship a God that loves us, that gave his life for us, and is worthy to be followed. And so today we're talking about image again, continuing the series for the next number of months. And we're getting specific around what image looks like. We talked what image is over the last couple of weeks. Now we're going to talk about what image should be. And we're going to make this statement, image should be like Christ. In fact, as we talked this morning, as we participate in communion, image leads us to the understanding that we need to be more like Jesus. But if you had asked me when I was a little kid, who do you want to be like? You know what I wouldn't probably have said? I probably wouldn't have said Jesus. In fact, if you had asked me when I was little, who do I want to be like? I would have told you it was this guy right here. Oh, I don't even have to say his name, right? For most people, you know who this is. For those that don't, this is Michael Jordan. In fact, at one point, I was going to name my first son Jordan Michael, because that's how much I wanted to be like Michael Jordan. I thought he was so cool. He was a snazzy dresser. I liked the way he walked. I thought he talked really cool. Like, there was just something about him. Like, people just wanted to be around him, be like him. At least growing up, that's exactly what I thought. I want to be like this guy. Even thought maybe if I shaved my head, that would be the ticket, right? I've talked to you. I've got this weird desire to shave my head. Maybe someday I'll do it. But even then, it was like, oh, Michael Jordan is so cool. Who was it in your life? If I were to ask you today, who was that person? I bet you can vividly remember it. In fact, I bet you I can hear the stories. You'd be willing to tell me or able to tell me stories of what you did to be like him. I had a strut. Michael Jordan had a walk. I watched him walk so I could emulate his walk. I wanted to be just like him. And I say that because I know there's little kids in here that are the same way. You guys want to be like somebody, right? So the challenge is to be like them in a positive way and to be like Christ. So on that note, I'm going to let the little kids get on out of here. You guys can go. Because they need to know that it's okay to look up to somebody, but it should be Jesus. You know, I wanted to be Jordan. And then I got into ministry, and I didn't really have an identity when I was in ministry. I tried to figure it out. And what I did then was to look at other people that were just ahead of me and ask the question, who should I be like? And I landed on these two guys, David Platt and Matt Chandler. Maybe you know them. Maybe you've listened to them. You probably have if you're here and you've been a part of Secret Church. David Platt's the pastor that leads Secret Church. Matt Chandler is another young guy that has done a number of things. He's in Texas. And I want to be like these guys. In fact, they kind of have the same look. What do you think? Do I fit? Yes? Maybe. I listened to a lot of their messages. I watched how they handle themselves. I even could tell you, like, Matt Chandler is very expressive like I am. And he puts his hands out there a lot. And he goes like this quite often. And David Platt is really serious. And you think he's about to cry, like, every sentence he speaks, which many of you think the same thing about me. When's Brett going to start crying? It's just a matter of time. In this message, I don't have one of those moments. But you never know. I could get passionate. And here it comes. (sighs) But I heard Matt Chandler speak one time about the dangers of emulating pastors because the reality of life is that the more we hang out with somebody, the more we become like them. And I heard him speak and challenge young pastors to fulfill their ministry, to figure out who they were, because if you watch too many pastors, often you become just like them. And so I took his words to heart. In fact, I don't really listen to many pastors today. I don't watch many videos because here's what I know about myself is the more I watch other people, the more I take on their mannerisms, the more I become like them, the more I act like them. And so I really right now just read what other pastors write because I can read it with my tone. I can read it with my attitude. I can read it with my energy, with my excitement, and I don't adopt their mannerisms. But see, that's the reality of life is the more that we're around people, the more we become like them. It just happens. How many people here have ever adopted an accent that isn't your own because of hanging out with people, (laughs) right? I know many people that aren't from Minnesota that talk like they are. And you're like, "Uh, have you lived here your whole life? They're like, no, I'm from Kansas. (laughs) It's funny because it's true. 
When we're around people, we adopt their mannerisms. We become who they are. And so the warning, the warning that Matt Chandler had for young pastors to be your own person is actually the opposite of what I'm going to say today when it comes to being like Christ. We're going to talk about being like Christ, and the challenge and hope is that we will become more like him. And so I want you to open with me this morning to Romans chapter 8. I mean, Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 30. If you don't have a Bible, I'd love to give you one. There's one on the back table here. If you don't have a hard copy, you'd like one, I can send you one if you're online. If you want, if you use the Bible app, it is, there are the notes that I have up here will be with you this morning. We're gonna be in Romans chapter eight. We're gonna see a couple of things today. We're gonna see that the more we spend time with Jesus, the more we'll become like him. And that's a good thing. And that's our hope, that image should be like Christ. And we'll see that this is gonna happen in two ways. The first way is voluntarily. The second way is involuntarily. So read with me in Romans 8, 28 through 30. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. For many of us, is a very familiar passage. If you've been in church for a number of years, you've probably read this. In fact, many of you probably memorized it in Awana if you've been a part of Awana. But I'm wondering today, how many people have ever looked at this passage through the lens of image? How many times have you looked at this passage in the lens of image? You may never have read it that way. Because see, this passage points us to the fact that those that love God were predestined to be like Jesus for the purpose of glorifying him. And it happens in two ways. The first way is this way, voluntarily. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. See, the context of Romans chapter 8 is Paul's talking about living in the flesh versus living in the spirit, which is a voluntary choice. He's giving the pros and cons of both of them, saying, here's what's going to happen if you live according to the flesh. Here's what's going to happen if you live according to the spirit. And his challenge is that we need to make a choice as to which one we're going to choose. Are you going to live by the flesh? Or are you going to live by the Spirit? Which brings us then to this point in Romans chapter 8. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. Well, what is love? Well, among many things, one thing we know for sure is that love is a choice. Love is a choice. In fact, we see this through all of life. Even those that I'm related to by blood, I have to choose to love. As we've been talking about image, we've talked about it being something that each one of us has been given as we've been made in the image of God. But then we talked about how it's been distorted, that the image has been distorted by sin, which caused separation between us and God. We were no longer near God. We fell out of relationship with him. We went our own way and we started to look more like this world than we looked like God. Sin severed our relationship with God, yet we still image God in some way, albeit often very dimly. Image is something that we all have. We then discussed, though, that God himself, Jesus, came to this earth to reconcile humanity to himself. In doing so, he gave us the ability to image God more fully by bringing us back into relationship with him through what Jesus did on the cross. In this life, then, through Christ, we can show others what it means to be more and more like the image of God every day as we are in relationship with him and encourage others to be reconciled to God through Christ. Our lives, then, as the church, are meant to show those outside of relationship with God what it means to intentionally live and image God in this world. So I want to clarify here. We've been talking the last couple of weeks. There's the inherent image that you've been given. And then there's the idea of imaging. And to now, today, now, we're making that differentiation. Each one of us has been given part of the image. But the responsibility of the church and each one of the individuals in this room, if you believe that Jesus is your Savior and Lord, or online, if you're hearing what I'm saying, our responsibility is to use it as a verb and to image God. We've been given part of the image. Our responsibility then to, is to image. See, I've been born with the image, but the desire to image God in this life is a choice. We must choose to be in relationship with Jesus and love him so that we aren't just an image, but that we start to image him. Image is inherent in our being. Imaging is a choice. I think it's clear that we understand this. Image is something that everybody has. 
Imaging is something that we choose to do. That you've been given inherently in who you are, part of the image of God. But our responsibility in this life is to show the world what it means to image him. If we believe that Jesus is who he says he is and that we have followed after him. It's a choice to love God. It's a choice to follow him. It's a choice every day to be more like Jesus. Anytime that we admire someone though and we want to be like them, it's a choice that we make to emulate them. Jesus is no different. We have to choose to be like him. You'll see here in a second, there's a family reference in this passage that will help us understand this choice. To describe it a little bit more in detail, I naturally look like my parents, particularly my dad, which is an example of the inherent image. In fact, I mentioned this a couple weeks ago. The older I get, the more I act like my dad. The older I get, the more also I start to look like my dad. In fact, I want to prove this. I want to show you something here that I think is kind of fun and also scary at the exact same time. A while back, my family was having a good time with a phone app, and this app projects out what it will look like when you get older. According to this app, here's what my future looks like. Are you ready? Here it comes. Ta-da! I will become my dad. <laughs> in fact, this app shows it. In fact, if you were to put my dad's picture next to this app, which I thought about last night, but I didn't have a picture that worked well with it. But if you were to put my dad up to this app, this is the picture from that app. This is actually me. If you know my dad, this is not my dad. This is me. I am going to be him. Ugh. Which we know, right? In fact, my mom said years ago, if you want to know what your wife is going to look like in 40 years, look at her mom. If you want to know what your husband's going to look like, look at their dad. Now, that's statistically probable, right? It's not that everybody will be that way, but in my case, it's 100% accurate. There it is. I have the inherent image of my dad in me. But there's a part of being like him that's a choice. See, I could choose to be the opposite of my dad. In fact, many of us do. Many of us choose to not be like those that we look like. In fact, I know many people that look like the individuals they've been given the image of, but they don't act like them at all. See, I could choose to show the world what it means to be like him, or I could choose to be the exact opposite of him. The same is true with God. We inherently show the world who he is through the image that he gave us. But we have to choose to love him and to show the world who he is through all of our being. Which scripture points to repeatedly. 1 John 2, 3 through 6. We know that we've come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. If we are to image God in this world, we must live the way that Jesus did. Otherwise, we are not in him. If we don't obey him, if we don't follow his commands, if we don't live the way that he has shown us, then this passage in 1 John says that we're liars. If we love him, we will live like him. 1 Peter 2.21 to this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Once again, we must follow in his steps. It's a choice. We were called to suffering if we decide to follow in the steps of Jesus. It's a choice. And Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. Those who love him is a choice. Who have been called according to his purpose. We have to choose to love God and be like him. And to answer then the call that Jesus makes to come follow him. Jesus makes this call to all people. We have to say yes or no to this call. Everyone then that answers that call has been called for a purpose, which is what this verse is saying. When we love him, we've been called. When we answer the call of Jesus to come follow him, we've been called for a purpose. We have a reason. There's a place on this earth that you've been put for a specific purpose. We see this specifically within the lives of the immediate disciples of Jesus. They'd been called for a purpose. What was their ultimate purpose? To go and make disciples, teaching others everything that Jesus taught them. Rephrased a little bit, I could say it this way potentially in regards to their calling. Go and show the world who Jesus was through who they were and teach others what he had taught them. 
which is also the call of all people since then that follow Jesus Christ. We call it the Great Commission. Right? That you're supposed to go and teach people. How? Through what he taught them. Also, by living lives that show the world who Jesus is because of who you are. Where do I get this thought? From the very next verse in Romans 8, Romans 8, 29. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. The purpose for why he calls us is so that we will be conformed to the image of Jesus. And Jesus then will be the firstborn of a whole line of people that have answered the call to follow him and have become like him. The desire is that people will look at Jesus and see how amazing he is and want to follow him. At some point, maybe there will be a little kid that left this room this morning that will get on a stage like this. Instead of putting up a picture of Michael Jordan, he'll put up a picture of Jesus because he wants to be like him because he heard people talk about him. He heard individuals in Sunday school, he heard a pastor on stage say, the person you should be like is Jesus. And he spends his whole life deciding, he or she just spends their whole life deciding whether they want to be like Jesus. Because Jesus is so cool. And he's cool because we don't get to see him in our lives today, which is the difference between Jesus and Michael Jordan. Growing up, I didn't get to see Jesus. He wasn't there. He wasn't playing basketball. If he did, I bet he'd be the best basketball player ever to play the game. I'm just willing to bet. He would have been absolutely incredible, but I didn't see him. At least I didn't see him face to face or personally. But I saw him through my mom and dad. I saw him through the people around me. I saw him in a way that today I stand up here with you and go, Jesus is so cool. And then my hope is, is that people will understand how cool he is because they see me. And they'll think the same thing when they see each and every one of us. That they will desire to answer the call, come follow me, when they see us looking like Jesus. Because what this verse tells us then is that all things work for the good of those that love him. For what purpose? To make us more like Jesus. That the good things that happen in this life is so that we will be more like Jesus. Which is the context of this passage. All things work together for the good of those that love him. So that we will be more like Jesus. And that he will be the firstborn of many people that will follow after him. God works for good to make us more like Christ. What is good then? Good's not that I get all that I want. Good is not that everything is easy. Good is not that I don't get hurt and I don't experience pain, but rather the good things in this life are the things that make me more like Christ. And guess what those things are? Everything. All things work together for good so that you will be more like Jesus. That you will look more like him. That you will stand in awe of him. That you will use your stories to say, hey, I went through this and this and this and this and this. And they were all good because I now look more like Christ. And this becoming like Christ was predestined to happen from the very, very beginning of time. So voluntarily, it's a choice. I must be like Jesus. I must choose to follow after him. I must be in awe of him so that the world will stand in awe of me as I follow his command, not in awe of me, of awe of him as they see me. As I follow his commands, as I love him more, it's a choice. And I was predestined to be like him from the very beginning of time, which brings us to the second way we become like Christ, and that's involuntarily. See, if following after somebody is voluntary to begin with, I choose to love them. Jesus then, or God then says that as we come after Jesus, we've actually been predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. That there's a voluntary peace and there's an involuntary peace that as I accept the call to follow Jesus, I'll just naturally become more like him because I've been predestined to do so. Which there are a couple big words here in this passage that make people a little squirmish. And those words are foreknew and predestined. For those God foreknew, he also predestined. For many, these words make you a little squirmish or squeamish. I don't even know if squirmish is a word. For many, it's because these words often are thought of in relation to God's decision as to who would be saved or not. In this case, though, I believe that this statement actually is not that talking about whether people be saved or not. I don't think this passage is about salvation. I think this passage is about image. 
In fact, the New American Commentary puts it well. The etymology of the Greek verb translated predestined suggests marking out a boundary beforehand. In the present context, predestination is not concerned with election to salvation. Rather, God has foreordained that believers be brought into moral conformity to the likeness of his son. What is predestined is that we become like the image of Christ. The purpose is that Christ might be the eldest in a vast family of brothers. If we were to bear no family resemblance to him, the intention of the Father would never be realized. The supremacy of Christ is reflected in the designation firstborn. It speaks both of his priority in time and of his primacy of rank. It also implies that there are to be others who will share in his sonship. That the predestination is that those that have been called, that answer the call, will become more like Jesus. So that he'll be the firstborn in a long line of people that will come after him. That he will be preeminent. Jesus is the firstborn. And just so we're all on the same page, he's also the favorite. Did you know that? Does God have a favorite child? Yes, he does. It's his firstborn, which every firstborn in this room right now is going, yes, that's exactly the way that it should be, right? I'm a firstborn. In fact, I tried to convince my parents, all of my brothers and my sisters should be just like me. Why aren't you pushing them in that direction? It didn't really work out. Even though I'm sure if you're a firstborn, you're thinking the same thing, because I know my firstborn in the room is thinking that exact same thing. Yes, I am the favorite, and everybody should be just like me. Well, God does have a favorite, and there is a firstborn. And his name is Jesus. And the challenge is that every single one of us actually should become like him that he holds the preeminence, that he holds the primacy, that he is the one that we should all follow after which is also a humbling passage for us because if we think that we're something and we're special, the answer is we're not. And that we can't be offended when the call to follow after God is followed then by the understanding that we were meant to be like Christ. In fact, in our world that focuses so much on individual identity, this is something that I have found many people rub up against. See, there is a somebody that we're supposed to be like. There is a way that we're supposed to live. We can't just do whatever we want and be me if that means that I go against what God wants. God says, I have a plan and I predestined you from the beginning if you answer the call to lose your identity and find your true identity, which is to be more like Christ. The fact that Jesus is named as the firstborn means that there will be many others that come after. In fact, it speaks of that. It uses that there would be many brothers and sisters that come after. You know who those many are? Us. Us. As we sit here today, we know that what's happened throughout the course of time has brought us to a place where we can read Romans 8, 28 through 30. And know that in the lives of those that have gone before us, God has lived this verse out. That they would be like Christ. And the next generation would be like Christ. And the next generation, and the next generation, and the next generation. It would continue to get passed on. That there would be many that would come after him. That we can hold these promises to be true today. Because you and I are the next generation. And our call is to be more like Christ. Which is a voluntary choice to begin with. And yet now we also see this process is one that's involuntary. Being like Christ has been determined by God before the beginning of time. It's in the DNA of those who God foreknew. It's like my resemblance to my father. It's built into us. There are two ways then that this voluntary, involuntary image happens. The first one is we're born with it. It naturally happens. First part of this context is like the family connection, right? It's like the DNA that you have with your family. It's like my resemblance to my dad, which is the power of the predestination language in this passage. God knew from the beginning of time that those that choose to follow him would be predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. It's like me and my dad, but I also liken it to the similarities that are seen in stories where identical twins are separated at birth. Identical twins will obviously look the same because of genetics, but as crazy as how, other, how often twins at birth, separated at birth, not only look like each other, but they also act alike. In fact, the largest separated twin study ever done was done here in the late 70s, early 80s at the University of Minnesota. And what they found is that genetics plays a huge role, not just beyond what you look like, but actually also how you behave. Most famous of the twins studied were Jim Lewis and Jim Springer. This is not a picture of the Jims. 
But it's similar, right? Twins. Jim Lewis and Jim Springer, who are identical twins, raised apart from the age of four weeks. When the twins were reunited at the age of 39 in 1979, they discovered they both suffered from tension headaches, were prone to nail biting, smoked the same cigarettes, drove the same type of car, and even vacationed at the same beach in Florida with their families. The similarities are there. In fact, you and I, in some ways, are like separated twins with Christ. We were separated from God at birth because of sin. There are things within us that show who Jesus is, but until we're reunited with him, we can never fully image him. Sin separated us from God and distorted the image, but not enough to eliminate all the similarities that exist, which is why we see in our world today, good things happen. Good things happen outside of believing that Jesus is who he says he is. Good things happen outside of acknowledging that God is who he is. Because there's still something inside of us, even though distorted by sin, we still have similarities to the one that we're supposed to be like. And yet sin separated us. God called us back. And those that he called back have an even stronger family connection than what the forces of this world can diminish. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. I want to go back to that piece. Jesus is the firstborn of many. See, God not create humanity to have only one family member. He predestined many to be brothers and sisters in the line of Christ. We are not Jesus' twin, per se, and that we're equal to him in that capacity, but we were meant to be like him. And we'll talk more about that next week as we talk about what does the image look like for all eternity. But just like the family here on earth that you were predestined to be born into, you didn't get a choice. It's also the case with the family of God. That we were predestined to be like him which is a very powerful and humbling passage. God wanted his disciples from the beginning of time to be like Jesus. That's us. That is so, so cool. The second piece then to this involuntary image is seen in this. Proximity breeds familiarity. The closer we are to somebody, this is the nurture piece. The closer we are to somebody, the more that we're around them, the more we become like them. Let's use married couples as an example in this one. In twins and children, there's DNA connection, but in married couples, there's still a family connection. It's just a little bit different. Studies have shown that as couples stay together longer, they become more like each other in action and in looks. In fact, you start imaging your spouse. Did you know that? In 1987, scientists from the University of Michigan set out to study the phenomenon of married couples who grow more alike over time. Their theory, which scientists still cite today, was that decades of shared emotions and behavior also resulted in a closer resemblance due to similar wrinkles and expressions that you start acting like your spouse and even start looking like your spouse. So what do you think? Is this true? Any similarities? Anything at all? My wife and I debated this week. She said no. She doesn't think she looks like me at all. I would disagree. I think the longer we've been together, the more we started to look alike. I can definitely tell you we started to act alike and probably in a negative way because I think she started acting more like me. In fact, this morning we were just talking about she gets the big eyes now and she's all like, and super intense and talks with her hands and tries to make fun of me because I do all of things. But I'm like, ha ha, you're becoming like me, which is a really good thing. Don't worry about it. (laughs) (laughs) But as we spend time together, we share the same emotions. We share the same attitudes. We share the same experiences. We have the same laugh lines. We have the same frown lines. We go through all the things that in some way we start looking like each other because of proximity. There's a proximity connection that's involuntary that just causes us to become like the people that we are with, which scripture calls this out too. By being with Jesus, we involuntarily become like him because he's planned this for us just by being around him. Two verses outside Romans points us to this, 2 Corinthians 3.18, and we all who with unveiled faces reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. This is something that God is actively doing every day because we are close to Christ. And then Ephesians 4, 20 through 24, that, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that's in Jesus. You were taught in regard to your former way of life to put off your old self which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self, 
created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. That there's an old part of us, what we were is gone. The new part of us is meant to be like Jesus. And that as predestined from the beginning of time, and as we spend more time with him, we will be more like him. Therefore, then, through these passages, we can see that when we answer the call of Christ to come follow him, we will be like him voluntarily because he's cool, and it's a choice, and I want to be like him. And involuntarily because God has predestined it. And as I spend time with Christ, I will just naturally become more like him. Which brings us then to this statement. Image should be like Jesus. When we ask the question, what does image look like in our culture today? We have the answer. It's Jesus. Image should look like Jesus. So what does it mean to be the image of God in our world today? It means to be like Christ. So how can we do this? How can we be like Christ? In order to be like Jesus, we must accept his call and spend time with him. Because of the predestination of God, making us more like Jesus when we answer the call, there will be things in my life that happen naturally because I've become more like him, because I've asked or answered the call. But that's only part of it. I must also spend time with someone to be like them. To be like Jesus, then we must accept his call and spend time with him and obey him and live like him, which is extremely important that we understand this concept in our world today because who you follow matters. Involuntarily and voluntarily, you will become like them. Who you follow matters. Why does it matter that we image Christ? Why does it matter that we follow after Christ? Because if you don't follow after him, you will image somebody. So who is it that you're imaging? See, when we follow Christ, we'll be like him. And yet when we follow anyone other than Christ, we will be like them. 1 Corinthians 15, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Bad company corrupts good character, voluntarily and involuntarily. So you're going to choose the spirit or you're going to choose the flesh. Who are you going to follow after? Which is the whole idea of Romans chapter 8. Do you want to follow the ways of Christ or you want to follow the ways of the world? Whatever you choose, you will become like it. So let's choose to follow Jesus. Because not only is this a great warning for us, but it's also we, something we need to think about for our kids. It's something that they need to understand, which is why keeping them in here for the first part of this message, they need to know who they're following. Who are they emulating? As parents, do you know who they're emulating? Do you know who they want to be like? Do you know who it is that they're following? Because we live in a world that's following. In fact, it's exactly what we call it when we go on social media. We are followers. We are following a lot of people in our world today. So who is it? Who are we following? Because we will become like them, which is our challenge. We must understand this. Who are we following? Because ultimately we will image them. A couple of weeks ago, I asked the question, what does the world see when they see us? I'm now asking it a little bit more specifically. Not just what does the world see, but who does the world see? Who does the world see when they see you? Do they see Michael Jordan? Do they see David Platt or Matt Chandler? Or do they see Jesus? Because the reality is who you follow, you will image. And who your kids follow, they too will image. Do you know who it is? There's a lot of people out there that we're following. I can guarantee you, as I look at our landscape, there's a lot of people that we're following who aren't named Jesus. And we're imaging them to a world that needs to see something different. Which brings us then to two questions. As we have these conversations with people, the first question we can ask, is Jesus worth following? If I came to each and every one of you today and asked you who you followed as a kid and who you follow today, my follow-up question would be, is Jesus worth following? See, I ask this to my kids regularly. As they're following Justin Bieber, and they're following the newest TikTok trend, and they're following all these things, I keep asking the question, is it worth it? Is it worth it? Is this worthy of your time? Is this worthy of your energy? Is this worthy of putting yourself into it? I would say the same thing for us as adults. Is this person worthy of following? If not, who should we follow? So as we talk to others, we can ask this question, who are you following? Are you following politicians? Are you following movie stars? Are you following influencers? Are you following athletes? Are you following medical professionals? Are you following religious leaders? Are you following people not named Jesus? 
think we need to stop or at least very clearly know what we're doing and then ask the question, are they worthy of following? See, many of us today need to take a deep dive into asking that question because I think we're imaging the wrong people. It's time that we image more of Jesus. So when you ask these questions, individuals, when you ask this question to yourself, it will give you great answers. It'll give you great insight into who you are, into who they are, where they're coming from. And it will help us come back to the fact that we need to be more like Christ. We need to show the world what that means and point people to a savior that's completely different than anyone this world has to offer. And then we can tell them, hey, he loves you and so do I. And he's asked me to love you in a way that I really want to, to give up my comfort, to give up everything I have because you're worth it. You have value. And let me show you because Jesus loves you and so do I. So if image is the essence of who we are as humans, an image does life different. An image should be like Jesus. Does there ever come a time when the image stops? What a great question. Let's talk about it next week. Pray with me. Lord, we thank you so much this morning for who you are. We thank you, our God, that again, knows us, that's coming after us. And the challenge this morning, Lord, is that we need to image you in this world. That we need to put aside all of the other people that we may be following, that we may be imaging. And yet understand that you have called us. And when we answer that call, you are causing us to be more like you every day. That involuntarily, we are predestined to be like you. And so I pray, Lord, that you will unleash that to this world, that they will see you more clearly through us. And yet voluntarily, we have to spend time with you regularly and put you first and preeminent, that you are the firstborn and we are following after you. And so I pray, Lord, that we sift through our lives and understand who we're following, understand who we're imaging. And if it's not the right person, then we need to remove them from that position and put you there instead. That, Lord, you will be the ones that we, you will be the one that we build off of, that you will be the one that we image, that you will be the one that we will be like, so that this world will see you through us. We thank you so much for who you are. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand in response to the preaching of God's word. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever bring. We live for you.
So this week, wrestle with the question, is Jesus worthy of following? Is he worthy of building your life upon? And hopefully you come away this week with the answer being yes. And then you go out in this world and share that with those out there who are building their lives on individuals not worthy of following. And ask the question, is Jesus worth being like? Because this world needs to see his love so desperately. Pray with me, Lord, we thank you this morning for who you are. We thank you that you are a God that loves us, that knows us, that cares for us, that's in this place right now. And that you're going to be with us as we leave this space. And I pray that as we go, that we can be more like you. That we will answer resoundingly the question, are you worthy, with a yes. That we will be people that go out there and that we will not be distracted. We will not follow after all of the things this world is offering that is not named Jesus. That we will put those things aside. That we will come after you and you alone. We thank you for who you are, Lord. And pray that as we leave this place, we truly will be people. That when the world sees us, they will see you through us. We thank you. We praise you. We give it to you. In Jesus' name, everybody said? Amen. Amen. You guys have a great week. See you next weekend. We were created in the image of God, but that image has been distorted. Sin has distorted that image in every area of life, but we still are valued by God, even though sin has distorted every aspect of life. So how are we reflecting God? How are we reflecting the image that he has put on us? Because we should be a reflection of who God is, his love, and as a Christian, as followers of Jesus, we need to be the ones that are doing that. We need to be the direct reflection of who God is and so that when people see us, they see the love that God has for his church, the love that God has for his people, and that he wants every single person to be in relationship with him. So I hope you were challenged this morning. Have a wonderful week, and we'll see you next week.